Hi, I'm Kelly. This video is for anyone who's learning Welsh or who has any kind of interest in Welsh who want to learn about how Welsh mutations actually make sense. So when you're learning Welsh and uh, you learn about mutations, there are two main things you have to learn. The first one is when to use them, so the grammatical context, the grammatical rules, so things about possession, gender, all those sort of things. And there's uh, too many of those to really introduce in this video, it'll be a very long video, so we are not going to cover that here. What we're going to talk about is which letter changes to which letter, and there are, um, there are reasons why this makes sense, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So there's a pattern to how the mutations work in Welsh. I'm sure when you first started learning Welsh and you first get those charts of the, um, the mutation, soft, aspirate, nasal, and it just shows this letter changes to this letter, it, maybe it just looks random to you and you have to find a way to try and remember which letter changes to which and, and, and how. Um, but actually there is a pattern and it's to do with how we make speech sounds. And so my background is in linguistics, um, in the field of phonetics and phonology, which is the study of how we make speech sounds. Um, and when I started learning Welsh 12 years ago, and I got one of those charts, I looked at it and went, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Um, and so I thought that if I taught people a little bit about how speech sounds work, how we describe them and how we categorize them, then maybe um, other people could understand and, and remember them a bit more easily. Uh, first of all, I just want to cover a little bit about terminology, uh, letters versus sounds. So when we talk about letters, we're talking about writing. And when we talk about sounds, we're talking about speech. And they're two different things. For example, in English, you have the letter C, and that can make a K sound, like in the end of electric, or it can make a S sound, like a electricity. Uh, so it can make, you have one letter with two different sounds it could be. Uh, so usually when I'm teaching phonetics and phonology, I always refer to sounds because I'm talking about speech sounds. Um, fortunately, Welsh has a better correspondence between the letter and the sound. They kind of match a lot better than in English. So in this talk, I'm going to kind of use the, set, the terms a little bit interchangeably. So I'll talk about letters sometimes, uh, which letter changing to which. But sometimes it's more appropriate to say sounds because I'm talking about this, the sound that comes out of your mouth. So when we describe um, speech sounds, we talk, think about them in three dimensions, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first one is voice, so using R, it's using your voice. Uh, the second one is how, uh, like the how dimension, how the airflow makes the sound of the letter. And the third one is where in your mouth the sound is made. So I'm going to go through each of those one at a time, and each one we cover, we'll compare them to the mutations and how they explain them and how how it makes sense. So the first one is probably the easiest one, voice. And so your voice comes from your voice box down here, um, constricting and vibrating. If you imagine you have a balloon, um, like I have one here, and you uh, don't tie it off and you pull the neck like this, and you get that sound, it's because it's gone sort of uh, tight and it's vibrating. And so that would be voicing. That's what you're kind of similar to what your larynx is doing. Whereas if you don't pull it tight and you leave it loose and the air comes out, it kind of just goes, it just comes out. So that is uh, basically what voicing is. So if we want to, um, and you can feel it happening. So if you say the Welsh letter v, v, and you can put your uh, fingers on your larynx down here, v, and you can feel it vibrate. So this one has vibration. Whereas on the other hand, if you say the Welsh then, and you put your fingers here and you feel, you can't feel anything, there's no vibration. So what you can do is you can um, say them both, um, alternate between them with no space. And you can feel your voice box, so switching on, switching off, switching on, switching off. So we call v, v, v a voiced sound and a voiceless or unvoiced sound. Um, and this doesn't just apply to those letters, it applies to all consonants. So if you say the letter k, k, and the letter g, g, say those to yourself and think about which one you think is voiced. K, g, k, g. And if you chose g, then you're right, that is the voiced, uh, the voiced letter. 
So they kind of come in pairs. So what we're going to do, I'm going to use this table um, the whole way through the talk, and um, we're going to make sense of how this works. So down the side here, we're going to fill in these labels. We're going to fill up the labels at the top as well as we go along. That's sort of two of the dimensions. But the voicing dimension, uh, we're kind of just in pairs. So I've put a little wiggly line under all the voiced sounds here. So you can tell which ones they are. You see it's kind of about half of them. But they occur in pairs. So p, b, p, b. Uh, they're said the same way apart from one is voiced and one is voiceless. So they're a pair. And t, d, k, g, f, v, f, v, r, r. So you see they're pairs, one is voiced, one is voiceless. Um, you've also got it with the nasals here. They're a little bit harder to do. The mm, mm, the, the voiceless pair it kind of doesn't really make much of a sound. So if you've had trouble pronouncing that while you're learning Welsh, that's why it kind of it doesn't make much of a sound. So if we apply this to nasal mutation, how does this make sense? What kind of pattern do we see? So you've probably seen a chart like this in your lessons. Um, b changing to m, mm, t changing to d changing to m, mm. and so if we add that little wiggly line to show voicing, you can probably see the pattern already. So you have voiceless letters only changing to voiceless letters, and voiced letters only changing to voiced letters. So they just retain the, the voicing that they have, so that can give you a kind of clue about when you're deciding which one changes to which. Um, uh, am I am I starting with a voiceless or a voiced letter, um, so it should change to the same thing. And just a note on the spelling here, you've got the h. You don't really pronounce a h, a h here. Um, it's just in the spelling to kind of indicate that it's a voiceless letter. Uh, so if you think of h, like a very breathy, uh, voiceless letter, then that's why it's in the spelling. It's just to contrast it with the, the other version, the pair that they come in. So here are our, um, uh, the, the letters involved in nasal mutation. Uh, p, b, m, t, m, d, m, and so forth. So the dimension of voice is fairly easy. You can, um, it's either one or the other. It's a binary. Consonants are either voiced or they're voiceless. And you can also feel it. So if you're not sure whether a letter is voiced or not, you can put your hand on your larynx and feel whether there's any vibration. So we'll move on to the next dimension, which is the how dimension. So we're going to fill in these labels down here. And by how, I mean how the airflow moves through your um, uh, mouth and sometimes your nose to make the sound. So the air always comes from your lungs, it comes up, and it gets pushed out your nose or your mouth, and we do things to it to change, to make different sounds. So if you say these letters, p, p, m, and think about what's happening to the air as it comes out. We'll start with the first one. So the air stops completely everywhere. It just stops completely. And then the kind of pressure builds up behind that. And then when you open your mouth, it gets let go and it comes out. So this sound you can't really um, continue and do uh, uh, continually because once it stops, there's just nothing happening really. There's no sound at all until you let it go. So the next one is similar in that the air is stopped completely in your mouth. Mm -hmm. There's no air coming out, but the air is now coming out of your nose instead. And this one can go on continually because the air is coming out. So you can go mm -hmm. and keep going. So the difference between p and mm is that one the air stops completely and the other the air comes out your nose. So the next one, the air for th is coming out continually out of your mouth, but there's such a small kind of gap that it's coming out in kind of a bumpy way. It's finding it hard to get out. It has to be kind of forced. So we're going to put these into our chart and see. So we'll start this one up the top and we call these letters stops because the air is stopped completely. Um, if you say all these letters, you can kind of feel how they are similar. P, B, T, D, K, G. They all stop the sound, uh, stop the airflow in some way. Uh, the next line here, you can kind of see how these are similar. M, M, M. These are called nasal sounds because the air is coming out of your nose. So that also makes sense. 
These next ones are called fricatives. And so if you think about that air, like I said, it's kind of bumpy. Um, I kind of think of it like friction. It's being forced out. And so you can hear, you can probably feel if you say these letters, they all are kind of a, a, a similar in the way that they work. As well. So there's three of our lines. We have two more. So the next two are R and L. R, L. So the first one, R, if you didn't grow up speaking a language um, or even a variety of English, accent of English, because some English does use this sound, um, then you probably have a lot of trouble pronouncing it because it's quite difficult if you didn't learn it as a child. I learned it when I was in my early 20s when I was actually learning Spanish um, and I used what I had learned in um, phonetics classes to help me learn how to pronounce it. And it took me about two months practicing in my car every day to learn how to do it. Um, so if anyone's interested, I can probably make a second video of how to do that, but we're not going to do that here. But what happens when you're saying R is your tongue is mostly tense, but the tip is, um, is loose. So then when you, the air comes out over it and your tongue is just behind your top teeth, when your air goes over it, it kind of opens and closes very quickly. And it, it, it touches the, the roof of your mouth just behind the top teeth. R it's doing it again and again. So that's how this one is done. The R. The next one, L. Your tongue is in the same position, so it's behind your top teeth. L, L. But the, sides, the air is coming out the sides of your tongue. And it's quite open, so it's coming out quite freely. So if we add these down here, we've got our pair. We call these trills. Uh, uh, so they sound kind of trilling, don't they? It's a trill. And the last one down here, your l all by itself. That's our lonely liquid down the bottom. Um, think of it as a liquid sound because it flows quite easily. And if we'll also, um, to help you, maybe you've had trouble pronouncing the Welsh as well. Uh, to explain that one, it is quite similar to l. Except the difference is you can see L is voiced and sh is voiceless. So if you switch off your voice box to start with, L, sh. And secondly, your tongue is in the same position behind the top teeth, L. It's just with L, there's more space for the air to come out. It's coming out quite easily. But with sh, the sides of your tongue are raised slightly and the air is finding it harder to come out. So maybe that will help you with your pronunciation of sh if you're having any trouble. So how can we apply this now to uh, mutations? Why does it help us make sense? So the how dimension. So look at these ones, p and f. I'm going to use the f letter here because they're, so this is what I mean about letters and sounds not always being the same thing. Um, f here is the sound. So I'm just going to use this one because it's in our chart. And t changes to f, k changes to h, h. So let's think of these on our chart. What, what, which ones have we got? P, T, K, F, F, K. So there, which ones they're changing to? So you can see there's kind of a pattern here. Look, these are all on the same line in the how dimension. These are all in the same line of the how dimension. So what's happening? All the ones on this side, P, T, K, are all stops, and they are all changing to fricatives on the other side. And also, there's no wiggly lines, so they're all voiceless. You don't need to worry about voicing with these uh, letters. They're all voiceless, and they're all stops, and they change to fricatives. So they, they change on the how dimension. That's what is happening in aspirate mutation. How can we also apply this to nasal mutation? Well, again, look at which sounds they are. P, T, K, B, D, G. Which of the lines in that how dimension, how do they match up? And the same with the ones on this side. So we're starting with stops and they are changing to nasals. So the same thing is happening in uh, the mutations here. You're changing from one how dimension to another in a very systematic way. You're changing from one version of, of this dimension from stops to nasals, like that. So you can see the pattern is uh, really clear and I think it makes sense. So that is our how dimension um, all completed on the side here. So now we're going to do along the top and fill in these fields, and this is the where dimension. So different parts of your mouth are moving every time you make a sound, and we can categorize sounds in this way as well. So um, we're going to use this diagram, and so what this is is someone from the side, uh, the head sort of cut in half, so you can see in the middle, and you've got your nose here and the nasal cavity, 
you've got your lips here, you've got your teeth, um, you've got your tongue here, and the palate up the top there. So that's just to orient to what you're looking at. So we're going to start with these letters here. They're all made in a similar way on the wear dimension. So if you say them to yourself, p, b, m, f, v, can you feel that like the same part of your mouth is, is moving every time you say these letters? P, b, m. And it's your lips. So your lips are coming together for these letters up here. They're all one group. P, b. So your top and bottom lip are coming together. These ones are a little bit different in that it's your top teeth and your bottom lip coming together. Mm. But they all involve the lips in some way. So we're going to call these our lips letters. And that's what they are, lips. P, B, V, all involving the lips. We'll move on to this column. You can see there's a lot of these in the same category. And these ones are F and V, F, V. Uh, so those two involve the teeth, and your tongue goes between your teeth here. And then down below, we've got all of these sounds. There's lots of them. T, D, N, H, R, R, L. Lots of them. For all of those, your tongue, tongue is going just behind your top teeth. So there's a little ridge here. We call the alveolar ridge behind your top teeth. Um, it's a little bump. You can feel it with your tongue. If you put it there and that's where your tongue is going for all of those sounds if you say t d you can feel that your tongue is there behind your top teeth so we're going to call these our teeth sounds and split them into behind between the teeth and then behind the teeth and then we'll move on to our final category and these ones are k g n g h so where do these ones happen? Say those and feel where it happens. What is your tongue doing? Where is it sort of moving in your mouth? K, g, k, g. So it's your soft palate. So up the back here is where this is happening. The back of your tongue is going up to meet the, uh, the soft palate, the back of the roof of your mouth. Uh, this one is technically slightly different. K, k, k. It's a little bit further back, but for our purposes, uh, they're in the same category. So we'll call these our soft palate sounds. So we've filled in now the where dimension of our table, and now our table is complete. So I just want to point out something, how, how this table makes uh, more sense than maybe you've realized. So on the how dimension, we're ordering the letters from the, a closed mouth, so completely closed, to getting more open as you go along. Fricative is a little bit more open, and then liquid is, is so open the air is coming out quite easily. So it's kind of from closed down here to open down here. And the top on the wear dimension is from the front of your mouth, lips, moving back to the teeth, moving back to the soft palate. So from the front of your mouth to the back of your mouth here. So the way we format this table also makes some sense about how it all comes together. So how do we now apply this um, wear dimension to our mutations? Well, we'll start with nasal mutation. Maybe you can see it already. So these top ones, p, b, m, are all lips letters. T, d, m, are all teeth letters. They're all made behind the teeth. And then k, g, m, are all soft palate. So when you're changing these, so if you've got, like, you know you need to do a mutation and you've got a b, as in bangor, and you want to change it, maybe you're uh, after the um, 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 because you're changing from a lips letter and you're keeping it as a lips letter. Bangor, um, mangor is how you're changing. And aspirate mutation, the same thing is happening. P, f, lips. T, f, teeth. K, h, soft palate. So you're just, you, you kind of feel which uh, where dimension your letter is in and you're keeping it in that same dimension when you're making your mutation. So we come now to soft mutation to try and figure out how this works. Um, but first of all, why is it called soft mutation? So nasal mutations make sense because they're changing from a stop to a nasal, it's a nasal sound. And then aspirate mutation, if you think of aspirate but like um, 
aspiration, like breathing, they're all voiceless letters and it's kind of, they're changing from a stop to a, like a breathy, like a fricative, a voiceless fricative is kind of a breathy uh, aspirate sound. And that's why it's called aspirate. Soft doesn't really make much sense until we find out something else about how we can describe sounds. So soft, we describe sounds of so as soft, the more like a vowel they are. So vowels are the softest sounds you can have. And vowels are always voiced. There's no voiceless version of vowels. So if you think of e, a, u, e, they're all voiced. So the more voiced the sound is, the more like a vowel, the softer it is. And also vowels also use, always use an open mouth. A, e, e, there's, your mouth changes, but it's not really blocking the airflow very much. And so the more open a sound is, also the softer it is. So we end up with two continuums um, from hard to soft. The first one is voicing, so voiceless, that's a harsher sound than ah, uh, ah, uh, it's a softer sound. And also you have kind of a continuum on the how dimension as well. So all of these uh, letters down here are stops, nasals, completely closed, and then you move upwards towards fricatives, which are more open, but the air is still having trouble getting out. And then to liquids, which are much more open and the air is coming out quite easily. So we'll look at, we have to put our um, soft mutations into groups because they act a little bit differently. So first of all, we've got this group, p, to b, t, to d, r, to r, k, to g. And you can probably see the pattern already. So these sounds are all voiceless and they're changing to voice. So they're becoming softer on the voice continuum. You're softening a p by making it b. You're voicing it. Uh, next, we've got this group. B to V, M to V, D to V, and these are all voiced already, so they can't be changing on the voice continuum. These are becoming softer on the sort of the how dimension. So they're all stops or nasals. B, D are stops, M is a nasal, and they're all being moved down here and changing to fricatives, V or V. So they're becoming they're softened. On the how dimension, they're becoming um, more open sounds. And you've got this case by itself. So you can see already this is voiceless, this is voiced, so it's becoming softer on the voicing continuum. And also uh, is a fricative, so it's already quite soft, but it's becoming softer by moving down this continuum to become a liquid. So this happens on both of the continuums. And then we've got one more, which is kind of its case on its own. G disappears altogether. Uh, there are historical reasons for this. G used to change to a sound which no longer exists in Welsh. Um, but for me, I just remember this as a case by itself. Like G just disappears. It's the only one that does that. It's kind of easy to remember. And what we're going to do is uh, anything with a red X, there's no change in the dimension. Uh, with a green tick, there is a change in the dimension. So we have, we'll start with this one, with the where dimension, because it's the easiest one, because they just don't change. Um, I put a little asterisk up here, because the linguists will probably get mad at me for saying this, because there is a bit of a change. So if you think of uh, the t aspirate mutation, changes from t behind the top teeth to th between the teeth. So it, technically it does change where it's being, where it's being pronounced, but um, for our purposes, um, categorizing why mutations happen, it's around the same area. So um, the reason why it happens there is because um, they're about in the same place. Same with, um, you've got your, which one, b changing to v, same thing. They're kind of around the same place. So, so our three, di three categories of our where dimensions help us understand why the mutations happen there. So every time you're making a mutation, you just have to keep it in the same area of your mouth. You get your letter, think, where is this one? It needs to change to some letter which is in the same area in my mouth. Next, we've got voicing. So um, most of them don't change in terms of voicing. Mu nasal mutation, um, if you start with a voiced letter, you need to change to a voiced letter. Same with aspirate, they're all voiceless, so you only ever change to a voiceless. And the same down here with this group of soft mutations. They're all voiced, so they stay voiced. These ones do change. So the p, t, r, k soft mutations are being softened with a voice, and so is the h soft mutation. And so now if we come to how, 
only one of them doesn't change in terms of how. It's um, the soft mutation here. So um, the p, t, k, they're all remaining. Uh, so three of these are stops, one is a trill. They're remaining the same on the how dimension. And then all the other ones change. Nasal mutations are changing from stops to nasals. Aspirate mutation and the soft mutations are changing from stops, or this one's a um, nasal, to fricatives. These ones are voiced and the aspirate mutation ones are voiceless. And of course this soft mutation with the changes as well. So maybe this will help you keep in mind the, some of the ways that they change. You're, usually you're just changing one dimension of how we um, describe our speech sounds. Um, either it's how usually or it's voicing maybe uh, and then in one case it's both. So here is our final chart and uh, we've made sense of why these letters are put where they are and how we describe them. But you might think to yourself why does this even happen? Why is Welsh even changing letters to other letters? Why are sounds changing from one sound to another? But actually you might be surprised to find out that we do this in English as well. It's just in Welsh, um, this has become part of the grammar, it's become grammaticalized. Uh, whereas in English it happens, we just don't usually put it into the spelling, um, it just happens in fast speech. So when you're speaking quickly, sounds will change. So as an example, you have the sentence, I live in Dublin. Think about these letters here, in Dublin. Where, where are they on the where dimension? They're both behind the teeth sounds, in Dublin. So these match, in Dublin, They're both behind your top teeth. Um, what if we say, I live in Bath, I live in Bath? You probably don't say this nasal letter here behind the teeth when you're saying this quickly in speech. You will pro they're both, this uh, letter here is a lips letter, so I would almost guarantee that when you're saying this in fast speech or just speaking normally, you would say, I live in Bath, I live in Bath. And it's similar to how Welsh says, Dwimbil and Mangor. You're matching, so this, this one doesn't change like it does in Welsh, but this one does. In English, English will match this. So it's like your, your mouth knows that the b is coming and just does that before it happens to make speaking a little bit more easily and to flow a bit better. And the same, I live in Glasgow. What kind of letter is this? It's a soft palate one, g, g. And you will say in fast speech, I live in, in Glasgow. I live in Glasgow, I live in Glasgow. And so it does happen in English, and it happens without exception every time anyone speaks. Unless you're speaking very, very carefully, I live in Bath, I live in Glasgow, which doesn't sound natural. In natural speech, everyone does this. The sounds will change as you speak, and it changes in other ways as well. We just don't usually spell it. Um, oh, and so the technical term is assimilation because the sounds are becoming more similar to each other. So sometimes it does actually come into the spelling, not often, but it does. So if we have the word independent and we break this into two parts, you have the word dependent, which means to rely on someone or something. If you want to make that the opposite, you add this prefix in, which means not independent, not dependent. And both of the sounds here is like in Dublin, they're both behind the top teeth sounds. What about if we have the word perfect? P down here is a lip sound. If we want to make the word which means the opposite of this, and we add the same prefix, but actually we change the spelling, imperfect. So you can see that sometimes it does come into the spelling in English. So I'm hoping now you understand how Welsh mutations actually make quite a lot of sense once you know a little bit about how sounds, specifically consonants, how, the, how they work. Diolch a phoblwch efo dysgu Cymraeg a chwil fawr.